Peter came to Anok, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew? How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow its Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Paul is employing sarcasm here. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. You know, this was a noteworthy confrontation between two of the most important Christian leaders in history. Let me give you some background on Antioch. Now, that was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, the main center of the Christian, um, the Gentile Christianity. And in Acts 11.26, it actually tells us believers were first called Christians in this city. And there was a strong church there comprised of two groups of people, the Jewish Christians, who had been raised keeping the dietary laws of Moses, and then the Gentile Christians who came out of the pagan religions and where they had no dietary regulations at all. One day, the Christians in Antioch received exciting news. A famous celebrity, so to speak, was coming to visit, Peter. You know, Peter who had walked on water, Peter who had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the grave, Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost and had 3,000 converts. You know, P Peter was the ultimate apostle. His reputation preceded him, and he was coming to visit their church. His visit sets the stage for what's about to happen between Paul and Peter. The scripture helps us discover a spiritual truth about Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. And as always, we discover a personal lesson we can apply to our lives. Let's read Galatians 2.14 again. Paul was talking, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follish the Jewish customs? The entire disagreement was about food, food and fellowship. It was about what Peter ate and who he ate with. And in Acts 10, God gave Peter a dream where he saw all kinds of unclean animals and God said, kill and eat. And Peter said, never, Lord, those are unclean. And, you know, God had said, don't call them unclean what I call clean. After that, Peter understood that the gospel was for Gentiles as well as Jews. And he went to the home of a Roman centurion and he ate with him. And so this was an issue that Peter had already settled. Think about it this way. Peter arrived at the church. They were having this big welcome meal and they were serving barbecue. We had beef brisket on one side for the Jews that um, want to follow the dietary rules. And then there are also pork barbecue for the Gentile Christians. And Peter was first through that serving line and everybody was watching. He loaded down his plate with both beef and pork. Then he sat down and ate at the table with everyone. Everyone sighed with a just big relief because they rejoiced to know that the gospel of grace had eliminated all the tedious rules and regulations of the Old Testament. And everything was fine until some other Jewish VIPs came from the Jerusalem church. When they arrived, Peter suddenly changed his behavior. He went to the fellowship hall and when he saw the pork, he was indignant. What are you doing serving pork? Don't you know that it's unclean according to the law of Moses? I'm a Jew and I don't eat pork, so get rid of it. I don't understand. If Paul wrote that Peter forced the Gentiles to follow the Jewish customs, perhaps Peter turned to the Gentile Christians and said, I don't want you eating pork either. Don't you know your Bible? Furthermore, the law of Moses forbids Jews and Gentiles eating together. So those of us who are Jews are going to eat together in here and the rest of you can eat at the picnic tables outside. But then Peter changed his behavior. I imagine the Jewish and Christians, uh, Jewish and Gentiles were just 
what was what is happening what is going on they're probably standing there with their empty plates thinking what a jerk peter has been scarfing down pork and eating everything with us for the past month how two-faced can he be you know peter was being two-faced he acted like someone set free by grace when he first arrived but then when the jerusalem jews arrived he reverted to the old testament rules and regulations Paul wrote that Peter acted like that out of fear of the circumcision group. He was afraid that he might report his behavior to Pastor James. So once again, we see the same old fearful Simon Peter, the one who denied Jesus Christ three times on the night he was arrested. Peter's behavior did not line up with the gospel. I love how the stories in the Bible never try to gloss over the mistakes and the failures of their main characters. That should help us to, to realize who influenced scripture. Let's face it, if ordinary people had written the Bible, they would have covered up all the faults of the heroes. But this book is full of stories of great people who are always failing and they should give hope to every one of us who have ever failed. We've all made poor choices and dumb mistakes, but God can still redeem us and use us for his glory. Peter's sin wasn't a sin of the flesh. He didn't lie, cheat, or steal. It was a sin of hypocrisy. Peter showed one face to the Christians before the VIPs came, and then he showed a different face after they arrived. The way he was treating the Gentiles made it as if he thought they were inferior to the Jews. And when Paul observed Peter's behavior, he had a gut reaction that something is just not right. And I don't know about you, but I always listen to that gut reaction. You know, Paul wasn't afraid to name names. And after he mentioned Peter, he wrote, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. If you look through scripture, you will see the word hypoc hypocrite and hypocrisy used a lot, even by Jesus. Maybe Jesus and his father built uh, sets for a Roman theater near Nazareth. I don't know. Maybe that part was left out of scripture. No, truly, hypocrite is also used to, to um, talk about an actor, um, those who wore different masks and played different characters. So just like that, someone who is two-faced. One face for what they say they believe and one for their actions. Being two-faced is definitely contagious. Peter's action of being two-faced influenced Barnabas to act the same way. And Barnabas is an important Christian leader in the book of Acts. His real name was Joseph, and we first meet him in Acts 4 when we read Joseph, a Levite, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought, bought with the money and put it aside to the apostles' feet. You know, he was an encourager that people called him by that nickname. He is seen elsewhere encouraging the apostles to accept Paul after his dramatic conversion. He was Paul's encourager, and on the missionary journeys, he was always with him. But even with all his good characteristics, he still followed Peter's bad example. We've all heard of the story Jekyll and Hyde. There's a novel and there's movies that tell the tale of Jekyll, who was a kind and respected English doctor who has repressed evil urges inside him. In an attempt to hide this, he developed a type of serum that he believes will effectively, effectively mask his dark side. And instead, Jekyll transforms into Edward Hyde, the physical and mental manifestation of his evil personality. One of Jekyll's quotes is, I thus drew steadily nearer to the truth that man is not truly one, but truly two. I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both. Dr. Jekyll held a deep belief in man's dull nature. Jekyll called this the hard law of life, which lies at the root of religion, he said. You know, the problem is, like Jekyll, we underestimate how bad our sin can affect our lives. We think if we segregate our lives only to later, we're going to find that that, that little bother of sin is really an invincible monster. The Jekyll side of Christianity is easy to find. Who do you love more than yourself? The answer should be Jesus. Yet we all struggle with selfishness. 
We like to do what we want when we want, but we want Jesus to take our lives, we can no longer be selfish. We should do all that is in our power to obey him. And most importantly, God gives us the assurance that he will always be there loving and transforming us, no matter how often our hide rears its ugly head. Last week we did communion at church and it certainly isn't this special serum for us to be able to mask our dark side, that's for sure. Because if we are truly in Christ, though, we do become an entirely new person. We still live in the old body, but at our deepest self, we are a new creation and a new vessel for the Lord. Communion is our time with God to confess our dark side, our wickedness, our sins. And when we take the bread and the juice, we should be turning every sin that we've done over to him and begging for his grace and mercy. And not picking those sins up again. We must place our trust in him and his promise that we are his people, his forgiven people. And we certainly can't be two-faced with God because he sees beneath it all. He sees in our heart and he does something amazing by telling us that he loves us even though we have that hide creature living inside us. God is interested in redeeming that creature and changing it. And when we are in Christ, we fight that continuing battle. We fight for a new identity, knowing that Christ is bringing life to your mortal body and that one day Jesus will take you home for eternity. God's going to meet us in our battles a hundred different ways. I know Hyde committed heinous crimes, and I'm pretty sure that you know no one sitting in front of me today has created those kind of things. But I have to say, a sin is a sin. And I can be honest and admit, I am a sinner just like Hyde. But the good news is, Jekyll is in here too. And I celebrate that person who is like God. Godly people like Peter and Barnabas are tempted. And they are the best of the best. We all have that point where another person emerges. One who is not too attractive. They are frazzled, they are angry, and they are impatient. I don't know about you, but there's times that I don't even like that other person. And a lot of times we know it's happening. We know we are changing over to our hide. And the only way to come back is to rely on our Savior. Paul wrote, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. Notice how Paul confronted Peter publicly. When I read this passage the first time, I, I remember thinking, why didn't Paul go to Peter face to face? After all, that is how Jesus taught us in Matthew. He said, go alone. And then if you don't hear or that they don't hear what you're saying, then take someone else. And if they don't listen, you take it to the church. Well, Peter's hypocrisy didn't just affect Paul. It affected others. And it was a public sin against all the Gentile Christians in the church. And that is why Paul confronted him publicly. You know, Paul was gentle when he did it. God probably knows how difficult it is for us to be gentle. He didn't blow his cool and start yelling and throwing out unkind words and accusations. He simply asked Peter a question. You're a Jew, but you've been living like a Gentile. Why are you forcing them to live like Jews? We don't know how Peter answered the question. He might have denied his behavior or he might have excused his behavior. It wasn't Paul's job to fix Peter. It was his job to simply point out to Peter his inconsistency. He was being two-faced. You know, Paul went on to instruct us how we are able to help when someone takes the wrong path. He wants us to be careful as well so we don't join them. He also reminds us of the law of Christ. He said to love God with all your being and to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, love requires us to help someone when they're on the wrong track. We need to speak the truth in love. So what happened to the three leaders? Did they separate over this issue? No. The Bible indicates they worked through it and continued to be partners in the gospel. You know, later Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth and named Peter as one of the most important Christian leaders. And in 2 Peter 3.15, Peter mentioned Paul. Our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. And Barnabas continued to be Paul's partner in their missionary journeys. The goal of loving confrontation is to unite, not to divide. And that's what happened in this case. 
You know, we must make sure that our actions are consistent with our beliefs. After all, we are too graced to be two-faced. Amen.